One of history's better known uh, politicians was uh, Cicero. Uh, whenever an assassination occurred in Rome uh, whose origins uh, were unknown, uh, Cicero would ask the question, cui bono? Uh, which translated means, who benefited? I want to find out who the culprit was. And murder investigations proceed this way, as I think all of us are aware when we watch uh, newscasts or read uh, mystery writers and so forth that you know, if a woman is murdered, uh, the husband uh, becomes the prime suspect and uh, vice versa. Now this doesn't mean, of course, that he committed the crime. The fact that uh, someone might have a motivation or might have benefited from a crime doesn't mean that they're the ones uh, who uh, committed the act. But it is both reassuring and troublesome, I suppose, to realize that, at least statistically, uh, if you are ever murdered, it will most likely be a friend or loved one who will do you in. Uh, you wouldn't want this task left to a complete stranger. But, but what about other wrongs? And in approaching questions of this sort, I, I would always like the words of uh, Thomas Pynchon in his novel uh, Gravity's Rainbow said if they can get you asking the wrong questions they don't have to worry about the answers and I thought about that in relation to the uh, response to the 9-11 commission uh, set up to discuss uh, uh, certain things or inquire into certain matters involving the, uh, the attacks of that day and here's a good example of someone who began with the wrong question you know, what was the intelligence failure that uh, produced uh, all of this? Instead of asking a more relevant question, who was responsible for 9-11? I haven't read their report, but what I've read of it in the newspapers and so forth, suspect, I suspect that that question was never, uh, was never inquired into. So the right question, to me, would have, been, uh, would have required going back to Cicero and asking the cui bono question. Who benefited from 9-11? And when I look around and try to figure out anyone who might possibly have benefited, the only one I can come up with is the American political establishment. Now, keep in mind, this does not mean, I want to emphasize this, this does not mean that they did it. Uh, it only means that they become what police in a murder investigation would call uh, persons of interest. <laughs> As Inspector Morse might have put it, a suspicion is not the same thing as an accusation. And I think that's one thing that has to be uh, kept in mind. Of course, we were told at the outset on 9-11 itself that Osama bin Laden was the architect of the 9-11 attack. But on that same date, one television network reported uh, bin Laden to have said, you know, I don't know why they're blaming me. I had nothing to do with it. Which, of course, uh, his denial should not be taken at face value any more than should the pronouncements of Mr. Bush. But we should, by now, uh, have developed a healthy skepticism of the words and actions of all political figures. It's a little bit like dealing with magicians. Uh, magicians are very adept at distracting our attention with wands and smoke and colorful cloths and uh, handkerchiefs and things like that, incantations, uh, for the purpose of Allowing, allowing them to deceive us into believing that elephants can be made to disappear before our eyes and things of that, of that nature. So when the political establishment creates a blue ribbon commission composed of men and women whose careers have been tied to the establishment, you can be assured that their principal purpose, like that of a skilled magician, is to engage in a kind of ledger, ledger domain that will prevent the revelation of embarrassing truths and to keep your mind distracted from the, tr from the tricks that are being played upon you. Now at this point, when you get into a discussion of this sort with uh, most people, you're usually greeted with the charge, well, you're advocating a conspiracy theory. And the purpose uh, for, for such a charge, of course, is to intimidate the questioner into not asking improper questions. In other words, to confine your questioning to uh, the politically correct or the safe areas of inquiry, such as intelligence failures and so forth. Like our response to a naked man at a party, or perhaps a naked emperor, 
Uh, most of us don't want to experience the shame that's associated with violating the covenant that we have seem to have embraced to never call a thing by its true name. Uh, a man that I've known for some time through, the, through a correspondence and only met uh, earlier this year, uh, Chris Tame uh, uh, from London, some of you may be familiar with him, uh, we got into a discussion on this uh, over in Holland this year and he said, I'm not interested in conspiracy theories, but I'm interested in the facts of conspiracies. And this is sort of the approach that uh, I'm quite interested in. Those who deny conspiracies outright are telling me a couple things. Number one, that they're completely unacquainted with history, uh, particularly Greek and Roman history, with their numerous intrigues, assassinations, cabals, plots, uh, etc. And secondly, they're certainly ignorant and unacquainted with Shakespearean tragedies, all of which uh, are just awash in conspiracies of one sort or another. I have a, uh, one of my a Jewish colleague of mine, I uh, got into a discussion with him one time and, and uh, discussing the, 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 the issue of conspiracy. He said, there, there are no conspiracies. I, I don't believe in conspiracies. I said, really? Can I quote you on that? And he said, well, yeah, why? Well, it's not often you hear Jewish people deny the Nazi Holocaust the way you just did. Well, what do you mean? Well, you know, then relating this back to the fact that uh, uh, the Nazi Holocaust was uh, uh, arose out of a conspiracy, an alleged conspiracy by the German government to uh, do in uh, Jewish people. I have another colleague who teaches antitrust law. He made the same <coughs> accusation, not a, accusation, they charged against me one time. Well, I don't believe in conspiracies. And I said, well, then we ought to reduce your antitrust course from a three unit to a one unit course. <coughs> because when you eliminate. <coughs> When you eliminate all the price fixing, the conscious parallelism, the, restraint, the combinations in restraint of trade, all the other conspiracy elements of the Sherman Act and all the other antitrust laws, you're not left with much. So let's make it a one-unit course. What about that? Well, no. Um, <laughs> and I'll be very blunt. I support any conspiracy explanation for which there is credible evidence. I am... Uh, unamused by, uh, shall we say, uh, f flighty kinds of conspiracy, conspiracy theories. I remember when I was in college back in the uh, 50s, back at uh, uh, the University of Nebraska, where I did my undergraduate work, that at, at this particular time, McCarthyism was still going strong. The House Un-American Activities Committee was still in place. And there was a state legislator uh, in Nebraska who decided to get in on the game and so he took the, the position that uh, it was time to investigate uh, the University of Nebraska faculty because uh, there was a big uh, communist conspiracy going on amongst uh, faculty members at the University of Nebraska. Well, at that particular time, there was not. I mean, there were a lot of uh, socialist collectivists, uh, as, as there are at every, every university, uh, but uh, not to communists. And somebody called him on this. And he said, you know, there's no evidence of any... Uh, communist conspiracy and his response was that just shows you how deeply embedded this whole thing is <laughs> because you wouldn't expect them to have it out in the open so it sounds a little bit like the reasoning coming out of the White House these days uh, but you get into other you know, other conspiracies through history in more, more modern times uh, uh, the Reichstag fire I think most of you are familiar with that the extent to which uh, uh, the uh, German government used that as a rationale for uh, its uh, particular police state activities. Uh, Pearl Harbor, the efforts of, of uh, Franklin Roosevelt to manipulate the Japanese into ultimately attacking uh, Pearl Harbor in order to get uh, the United States into a war that 90 some percent of the American people at that time did not want to get into. Those of you who are not familiar with that, I draw your attention to the book uh, uh, Day of Deceit, and the author just s s ran right, <laughs> right by me. Maybe somebody can tell you. Stint. Uh, uh, Stint, yeah. Um, that, that came out a couple of years ago. You might also be aware, some of you probably are aware, of the Operation Northwoods uh, a, a scam uh, that James Bamford reveals in his book, A Body of Secrets, uh, that in the early 1960s, 
the Joint Chiefs of Staff had put together a plan uh, directed toward an eventual uh, attack on Cuba. And part of this plan would be for people in uh, the United States to be shot in the streets, uh, planes to be hijacked and destroyed, uh, terrorist acts to be carried out in major cities, bombings and so forth, uh, innocent people uh, to be framed for these bombings uh, and the like, all for the purpose of blaming uh, Castro in order to rationalize uh, a war against Cuba. Bamford speculates that this plan may even have originated uh, with Eisenhower himself, but it was certainly created by, approved by the Joint Chiefs of Staff, not by some lowly lieutenant uh, uh, who had nothing else to do over the weekend and dreamed this thing up. The Cold War itself was premised on an international communist conspiracy, and those of us who denied this and saw the Cold War as a scheme for corporate state interest were attacked by the Anti-Conspiracy League as paranoid conspiracy theorists. Um, but it's interesting, you know, right after 9-11, we had uh, George Bush getting on television and telling us, you know, let us have no conspiracy theories about all of this. Uh, he then began expounding on his own conspiracy theory. You know, the Al-Qaeda, the Axis of Evil, International Terrorist Network, Osama bin Laden and Saddam Hussein. In other words, any conspiracy theories that are outside the realm of what is politically correct are not to be uh, examined. Uh, stick with the conspiracy theories we give you, and uh, you'll be all right. Those, those who believe in establishment conspiracies are patriots. Those who suspect the establishment of its own conspiracies are paranoid. You know, they conspire, but we do not. Paranoia, uh, in, this, in this connection, uh, is not a fear of others, but a baseless fear of others. Uh, what would one say of a Jewish person in Nazi Germany who thought the government was out to get him? Paranoid? If so, what would you say about another Jewish person in Nazi Germany who didn't think the government was out to get him? Psychologically healthy? Does paranoia, in fact, not describe the state of mind of U.S. government officials today who see all of us as potential terrorists, airport searches of persons and baggage of everybody, armed security guards, helicopters patrolling the cities, government buildings overly protected. And it's very interesting. Uh, I was in a, a city uh, a government building uh, a few weeks ago, and uh, over in Glendale, uh, California, you just walk in. No big searches or, or anything. Federal building you go into. Uh, uh, any building has government offices, and it's you know it's like what getting onto a military base uh, used to be 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, government and government officials and politicians with all their extraordinary security. Uh, who are the paranoids? And of course, the clearest example of this sense of paranoia, I think, is uh, President Bush's line that if you're not with us, you're against us. Well, I think it's time for us to stop allowing ourselves to be intimidated into not asking questions about the schemes perpetrated by those who lie, deceive, threaten, and coerce us into psychic obedience. In the 20th century, governments killed through wars and genocide some 200 million people. And I think it's now time to say enough. It's time for us to speak the truth, not just to power, but more importantly to ourselves and to one another. We must stop being afraid of our own minds and to relearn what we insisted upon as children, namely, to call a thing by its true name. A, a, a friend of mine, uh, a, a Swiss uh, psychiatrist that I have corresponded with and talked with a number of times, was telling me about a, um, an Inuit uh, elder, uh, an Eskimo, a man who had been invited to a conference over in Europe. And... Uh, when he got up to speak, he made this statement, said, Your children yell and scream. You lie to them. And I can't think of a sentence that, more, that better encapsulates uh, the state of Western culture than that. Your children yell and scream. You lie to them. I also recall the words of, and I don't remember who it was, but I recall the words. Maybe somebody here can uh, give me the source. But it's either John Stuart Mill or John Locke. 
who once said that a man has a moral obligation to not allow his children to live under tyranny. And I've always, I've always liked that. I, I think it's time to take moral responsibility and begin asking what Thomas Pynchon would consider the right questions. One might begin by asking what role, if any, did the American political establishment play in creating or at least having foreknowledge of the events of 9-11? Again, these are questions, they're not accusations. Uh, it, it gives us a, uh, an avenue, an approach to begin asking uh, for relevant facts and to have the investigation go wherever the facts lead. This calls for a genuine inquiry, not the 9-11 uh, charade that was conducted. Uh, it's a little bit like asking, you know, having the mafia investigate itself. Uh, bring out some good, in, good inqui inquisitors, if you will. Uh, Seymour Hirsch and John Pilger and Noam Chomsky and Robert Higgs and Lou Rockwell and Justin Romando and others uh, in this room and being a part of the people who you could count on to not give up the inquiry, to take it wherever it might lead. I think for the sake of our own lives and the lives of our children and grandchildren to whom I think we do have a duty to uh, protect from tyranny, let us no longer settle for the kinds of non-inquiries into such topics as failure of intelligence systems or need for an, energy, an enlarged military police state. These questions may satisfy the anesthetized minds that watch Fox News uh, or accept media-related press releases that they ought not to satisfy intelligent minds. My book, an early book I wrote, Calculated Chaos, was dedicated to one of my folk heroes, uh, Dorothy's dog, Toto, in L. Frank Baum's The Wizard of Oz, a free-spirited mutt who exposed to his awestruck companions <coughs> the humbuggery being perpetrated upon them by the wizard. As the wizard's deceit was being revealed to those who trembled before his smoke and mirror show, spiced with terrorizing shouts designed to keep his conscripts in obedience to his will, he was heard to admonish his audience, pay no attention to that man behind the screen. Such has been the response of every political schemer desirous of keeping his or her followers from an awareness of the nature of the politically self-serving rackets being perpetrated at the expense of the alleged beneficiaries of political systems. <clears throat> I'm reminded of the closing scene provided by another fabulous, George Orwell, an animal farm. The pigs had schemed to tyrannize their barnyard brethren with the same kind of lies and factual distortions that have long emanated from the district of, coll of collectivism. <coughs> War is peace, freedom is slavery, <coughs> love is hate, all animals are created, or all animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. At the end, the pigs conspired in the living room of the, of the, of the hated farmhouse with the human business interest from town who had participated in the systematic exploitation and killing of the denizens of Animal Farm. <clears throat> As the pigs conducted their business with the local humans, the other animals looked in the window of the farmhouse to discover the conspiracy that had been playing, been playing, out, that had been playing out at their expense. The story ended there leaving us to contemplate what, if anything, the barnyard bourgeoisie and the pastureland proletariat might have learned and what responses they might have made to this awareness. <clears throat> At a time when our lives, liberties, and wealth are being consumed by a leviathan that is metastasizing itself throughout the body of all humanity, it is incumbent upon us, the living, the protectors of our children and grandchildren, to insist upon looking where we are told we ought not to look and to resist those who warn us to pay no attention to that man behind the screen. Thank you.